For sure, he was pivotal, uh, especially in the early part of uh, my career. And then I saw someone from here to outside the box and I'm like, no, oh no. <laughs> but sometimes there's something that you've never seen before and you look at it and go, well, that, that works, that's quite good. And like, next year it'll be like Gandalf or something like that. <laughs> with three British Superbike titles to his name with Neil Hodgson, Greg Levere and Leon Camier, a host of race wins in World Superbikes, a step to MotoGP with Nicky Hayden, culminated in the 2020 MotoGP World Championship with Joan Mir and Suzuki. Last season, he helped Fabio Di Gianantonio to his maiden race win at Qatar with Grassini Racing, and 2024 sees a new rider come to his side. Six-time MotoGP World Champion, Marc Marquez joins the Grassini Racing family. That's Frankie Carcedi. This is Off Track, the motorcycle racing podcast. Frankie, welcome to the show, mate. How are you? Good. Thank you very much. That's, thanks for joining us, mate. We're up at Laceby Manor. We've kicked Roger Burnett out of his office again, gratefully, um, which allows us to sit with this great view and uh, just relax looking at the golf course. I think you'd rather be out there playing, wouldn't you, than uh, sitting just... here chatting to me. Just go see out the corner of your eye. Yeah, I'm just eyeing it up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to get something up. Get something done up here, I think, with the uh, with the guests that we have and have a, a day out. I think it would be fantastic. But mate, welcome to the show. Thank you for sparing your time for joining us. I know you're, you're heading off to the Far East tomorrow, so it's all a little <laughs> bit short notice. But thank you for coming up, mate. It's uh, hugely appreciated. We'll start off. How did you get started in this business? How do you end up becoming a Moto GP crew chief? What's your path? Um. I'd say conventional, but not really. Um, as you do in this country, GCSEs, A-levels. Um, I went to Loughborough University, which is a university with mainly for sport and engineering. Um, fortunately, I, uh, with a bit of push, I managed to get, get away with a, a, a degree from Loughborough. Um, and I, at that time, I was uh, applying to go into Formula One. I'd had some feedback and everything, and then quite randomly, um, Colin Wright, who's probably one of the most successful BSB managers of all time, um, his wife worked in a Halifax bank, and um, yeah, I was hoping in an account, and uh, just while we were waiting for it to open, she was asking me what I was doing, I was explaining, you know, I was into motorsport, looking to get into Formula One, and she told me who her husband was, um, before you know it, I got a call from Colin that night and it was like, right, why don't you come to Donington tomorrow? And within 24 hours, I was at Donington track and um, I think Troy Bayliss had just finished his season. So it was Neil Hodgson and um, Niall McKenzie. And um, I'm going to be honest, no idea who anyone was because I was always into cars from a, from a young age. And um, I loved it that much. Um, I had the that test went into another test and then that went into the first BSB year and I sort of never looked back at Formula One and that was it. Went straight into bikes. Who did you work with that first year? Did you work with Neil or Niall? I was sat uh, in the middle. Okay. So I was uh, an electronic engineer. Um, it was the, I'd say the first, but one of the first where yeah. the electronics were and data acquisition on, on the Ducati bikes. And um, there was a good friend of mine who I saw the other day, Giacomo, um, sort of trained me up that day. And uh, I think they had someone in line. And then there were some difficulties. Colin said, why don't you do this for a year? And um, yeah, I loved it. And it was this 23 years later. And then here we are, here we are, 23 years later. Did you follow then into World Superbikes when you were at GSE for a while with Colin? Yeah, I mean, you know, you need a bit of luck and everything on the way. I mean, I jumped straight into the best team in BHB with the best riders, one up and coming, one on the back of being an X500 GP rider. Um, they won the British Championship first year. They did two wild cards, maybe three wild cards, and they won. The they won it, days. yeah. Um, and winning Neil won as well. at Donington. Neil won at Brands Hatch, and I was like, oh, "This is all right." This is... <laughs> um, and um, yeah, then um, 
I think a lot of teams always say we're going to move up and everything. Um, they did the same, but they did move up straight to World Super Bike 2001. So I'd only done the one year in BSB uh, and straight into World Super Bikes. Um, and yeah, Neil, well, I think I'm sure he won quite a few races actually, even in his first year. Um, some pole positions, everything. It was, yeah, it was an incredible experience. What are your favourite memories from? those first seasons in sort of BSB and then World Superbike with Colin? God, I don't know which stories I can say or not. <laughs> uh, there was definitely one in uh, Kyle Army <laughs> when we went on safari, but that's uh, I'll leave Neil Hodgson to explain that one. <laughs> We've got Hodgie coming on in the next three oh, or four you? weeks. So yeah, just, just, just ask him about <laughs> that one. Um, I think as a young kid, um, it's not only the love of the sport, but to go to all these amazing places that you never even dream of when you're a kid. You might, if you're lucky, go to one or two at most, but um, you know, you're going to South Africa, you're going to Australia. I mean, now you talk about it when you go to Australia, it's like, you know, I've been 30 times to the same place, to the same island, but actually, especially that first year when you go, it's uh, an incredible experience because you, as well as a racing, you're taking up the place, the different cultures, everything. So it's for, you know, a young kid to come out of university was an incredible opportunity especially, and experience. Especially so soon. There's normally, you, I say the rule of thumb is kind of maybe two or three years in BSB, cutting your teeth, learning the sport, learning the people. But that rapid ride, <laughs> you, you, but then you wouldn't know any different either. So there's there's two sides to it. Yeah, like I said, I think with everything you do, you always need a bit of luck. Um, you know, as they say, I picked the right lottery ticket straight away. And um, with the riders, I mean, that's the other thing. You're only as good as the riders. And the better the riders, the more you learn. The more you learn, the more you can pass on. So it's like a feeder chain. So to have that head start straight away, um, it gives you a lot of experience and a lot of oomph, I don't know what the word is. Momentum. Momentum, yeah. Yeah, gives you the momentum within the sport because it is, it's is—it's it's a, a steep pyramid, not just for riders, but for staff as well. No, absolutely. It's, um, There's only so many crew chief positions available within each team. Yes, I always or, say or that. A data you know, engineer the... to then crew chief. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm quite lucky because I only I was an electronic and data engineer only until 2004, and then from 2004, so 19 years, always as a crew chief, barring one for Nikki. Um, but um, I've always maintained a lot on the electronic side because it's the area that has grown over the years and probably the most fundamental. So. Fortunately, I started when it first started, but I've always tried to keep on top of it because like I remember a year in the past, one year where you sort of just concentrate on something else and you forget and then you're like, wow, okay, that's changed, that's changed. So you've got to be on top of it. It must be the, well, it, I, I would, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn, but it, it is still the fastest moving area in terms of development of a motorcycle. Because chass from um, from an Olin's perspective, from a Brembo perspective, they all progress, but not quite as quick as electronics, I would suggest. Yeah, I think um, until fairly recently, for sure, um, every year it's completely, you know, there's big upgrades um, and a lot of changes. Um, and like I said, it's not just... <coughs> It's also understanding the strategies because the strategies are where they change. So it's understanding the technically what's changed um, with the strategies themselves, what sensors, because there's always new sensors. Um, you know, it's like a tire. Once it was just one tire pressure, then there's a tire pressure, temperature, humidity, internal, external. It's everything just blows up. So it, I'd almost say now it's not controlling the bike, but it's almost the heart of the bike. 
you know, yes. because if you haven't got the right electronics, it doesn't matter what you do and how you build an engine, it's not going to work. Um, so everything goes. You can together. have all your spring rates in the line. You can have everything you need, your compression, your rebound, everything can be there. But if that side doesn't work. Yeah. And that's where it, it should. Well, that's where it gets tricky because you have, I mean, it's like back in the day, you could see a suspension sensor and a uh, fork and go, well, that's too soft. That's too hard. Well, with how the electronics are now and with the engine brake and everything, it's quite possible it shows that it's not soft or it's too hard, but actually it's the opposite because of how the electronics are working. So unless you have a really good picture of what's going on, you, you've got to be very careful because it's very easy to make mistakes as well. <laughs> how do you translate that then with with a rider as as the electronics develop? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this now before, then we'll get back to, to your career and the riders that you've worked with. How have you had to develop your um, your communication skills with riders over the years because the electronics have changed or do you kind of keep it you know keep it simple as, as often as you can um for sure the more you know the more can go wrong because the more you can play with and yeah you can you can soon lose your way quite easily um I think the biggest aspect I've always tried to take is um, wherever I've been, whatever rider, whatever team, whatever bike, I'll always try and, I don't want to get told this at home, but I analyse too much, but always like to learn something from the rider, from how they ride, because anything I learn, I work with another rider and it gives you information to pass on to the next one. Um, same with staff, crew chiefs on the other side. Um, it's never been a case of beating them or being the better. Or I always look and go, right, what is the one thing that they do better than me? Because I want to do that as well. So every year I'm always trying to learn. Obviously, the more with age, it gets harder. <laughs> you, know, well, you know, I can speak quite a few languages, but Christ, I've tried now. And it's, uh, I don't know, it must be the age thing, but it gets harder and harder. Uh, I think when you're young, you just pick everything up. Like More that. of a sponge, the, yeah. the sponge of youth. Yeah, exactly. When I when I watched the, um, I was doing a little bit of research before we before we sat down uh, over the last couple of weeks, and I watched the MotoGP podcast that you did with Fran and with Matt um, first on the brakes, uh, last on the brakes, whichever one it was. I can't remember which way around. No, I, yeah, yeah, it's one of them. I can't remember. Well, Matt's new company is first on the throttle, so I guess it might be last on the brakes. Um, and one thing that you said that, that stuck with me was something that we could all do is how much you've retained from the people that you've worked with and use that going forward, taking sort of the best bits of everybody as much as you can and encompassing that in what you do to now become Grassini crew chief, world champion crew chief with Joanne Mia. Yeah, I think everybody has their own style. So you, you never forget that. But there are certain aspects of how they ride um, and they all have their own different way. But sometimes there's something that you've never seen before and you look at it and go, well, that that works. That's quite good. Um, and it's just information you can pass on. So it's not just being a crew chief and going, right, well, I'll find you the best set up bike, put some tyres and fuel and go. Um, I would say, especially in the last few years, that you can actually pass information on to riders. Um, in fact, this year is one of my first quite different uh, years, well, the one that's coming up now, because I've always tended to have riders um, that have just sort of started off or very new. So uh, it's like when Joanne Mir came to Suzuki, it was his first year. So it was always like, you, you, there's a lot you can do to explain uh, and explain how other riders have done it and how to ride a bigger bike. Almost the same with DJ because um, he'd done one year. Uh, I struggled a little bit, but something quite similar. Um, so it wasn't just setting the bike. It was also explaining how to ride the bike. And then, you know, go back as far as when Eugene Laverty first jumped on a super bike or Leon Camier. Um, yeah, it's... So this next year is a little bit different. 
we'll come to that later on because that, that's going to be a fascinating part of, of of what we talk about. But when you when you're sat as a crew chief, and I've spoken to to, to Spanner about this, and spoke a little bit electronics with Tim C, who I know you know very well. Um, he actually put us in touch, so thank you, Tim. The Australian or. He's, he is Australian, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> the Kiwi Scott. <laughs> the Kiwi Scott. Um, he was on the show early December with Mike Norton. So we did a, a chat with them down at Alton Park, and that was fascinating. That was so well received by the viewers and the listeners. I sit there and so I can't glaze over because I have no mechanical or electronic, as you'll know from the chat as we go through. I have no knowledge. That's, it's new to me as well. It's learning for me. But when you, when you actually sit down and... and Tim was explaining this. There are points where you can look at the data that comes back and you know whether a rider has it or, I wouldn't like to say doesn't have it, but isn't quite in the same ballpark with the, the throttle traces, with how they are on the bike. and The things that you can see through data, it, it blows my mind. Yeah, I mean, what are the main... <laughs> It's a little bit sad for some people, but one of the most exciting things is when you actually look at data for the first time on a rider that's completely different. Because you have absolutely, you might have these perceptions, but you have no idea. Um, and it's, you know, you get a bit of a buzz when you see something. Oh, God, never seen that. Or that's new. Or, But like you said, you whether it's their throttle trace, whether it's their how they brake, how they use the front to rear brake, um, even things like uh, change of directions. I mean, I had one, I've seen data from one rider that used to brake and accelerate at the same time. I'm sure you've heard of the famous Yanoni. You know, he does something very differently with the with his Yanoni brake trace. Yeah, Yanoni's brake trace and yeah, is. Um, Something that you don't see in many riders. Mike, but, Mike Norton, I'm sure he alluded to that with Taz. Taz does something similar with the, with the throttle and the brake that a lot of other people don't do. Right. And, and it's, it's a, cer a certain technique of riding that if you can do it, you've nailed it. If you can't, it's not something that you can learn overnight. It's something that's been drilled into you as, coming th as you come through <coughs> and as you adapt to each motorcycle as you ride it. But it, I mean, Ian only back in World <coughs> Super Bikes this year after his little hiatus. Did you, you've seen the the, uh, the information? Did he have the potential to go to, to be a contender? How's that for a better word? Um, with all the years out, it'll be tough. But Philip Island is the first race, and arguably is one of the greatest riders around that track. So wouldn't be surprised at the first race. I it always throws up anomalies at Phillip Island anyway, doesn't it? <coughs> yeah. Usually. <coughs> Excuse me. No, no problem. Um, yeah, we already had a little bit of a joke that we could probably see him getting pole position there or something. That um, I think he'll be quick, but it will take time for him to adapt. And um, for sure, he's a special talent. Um, but each class is their own. He's been away from the sport for a lot of years, so... You know, you saw actually with uh, Danilo last year that as the season went on, he was starting to learn, understand, and starting not getting the podiums. Yeah, we spoke to him at um, Donington. We had a chat with him there, and he, and he admitted he's like, yeah, for sure, it's been a lot harder than I anticipated. And it's like, yeah, it has, because you, you kind of expect a, a GP rider to drop straight into World Superbikes and immediately be on the pace when. There's still the weight thing with Danilo. He's still a, a, a bigger rider, especially than Alvaro and Johnny to a degree as well. So that's always going to be something he has to work with. But the bikes, the, they're still, you know, they've got two wheels and they go around in circles, but that's where the similarities <laughs> end in a lot of ways. I think the two, everything's too different now. Um, you know, I can't even, we actually joked about it the other day. I think if you've got your parts list on, actually making a GP bike now, I think you're well into the millions, you know, three million or something. If you actually put each part and the yes. price of each part, you won't be far off. Um, per bike. Per bike, yep. you got to remember that um, a lot of these parts, I mean, imagine, for instance, the old Suzuki team or Christ, you had two bikes. So when you make only six of something or eight of something, then the, the price 
is really, really high. But um, we said, yeah, if you actually, you know, because you can actually, you have parts list and everything, mileage, everything. Um, if you actually put the price of everything, you wouldn't be far off. And wow. um, I think that's part of the problem. Everything's got too far away, you know. Unless you take the anti-wheelie off, you try getting a GP bike to wheelie now. It's um, you, You'd struggle. In fact, a lot of rides, I think Joanne had one on the Suzuki. He had a button he could press to turn it off. So after a race, he could do so a at wheelie. At least he could do a wheelie on yeah, the slowdown lap. I think it was one of the first things he asked. Just yeah. disengage the anti-wheelie. Yeah, it's, like I said, it's not so much just electronics, but how they're designed. You know, the, the bikes are a hell of a lot longer. The torque of the engine, there's, everything's quite different. The tyres are different now as well. So, um, in fact, I, from my understanding, that's one of the bigger, the bigger issues they have now. Yes. So, is there one big thing that's? I probably know the answer to this before I ask the question. Is there one big thing that's changed on the electronic side since you started in MotoGP that you could put your finger on, or is it a culmination of like the aggregation of marginal gains, as Dave Brailsford said? It's just a continuous progression. It starts from adding sensors, understanding a brake, a throttle, then your suspension. Then it goes to having light traction control, then traction control into engine brake, then into a, not just an anti-wheelie, but quite a sophisticated, then it's even traction control. It's not just a traction control, which measures the front and the rear speed, now it measures your, it measures, it, <laughs> I don't even know where to start, the cut pattern, the, um, you can map, map the engine in a different way, do you retard the engine, do you cut the engine, you know, it, just one thing becomes super complicated. Um, it's also hard for us as well because it's like, um, you make, over the years you make mathematical channels from the other sensors and calculations and mathematics you can use. The problem is now is you have all the engineers back home that do it and you've gone from 10, 15 years of doing them all yourselves to others doing them and then you've got to do something yourself and you're like, crikey, I can't remember how to do that. What's the function? So it's, you've got to keep a lid on it and an understanding of it, but yeah, it's fortunately if you're in the in the in that area and working with it you understand as it progresses because you have to because if not you you can get lost quite quickly is it something that still excites you for the, the year on year the new package the new software package that comes through and having to deal with it or do you think hang on what's next <sighs> it's not so much excites me <laughs> uh understanding it's nice in fact i'm actually because also you as a crew chief or an electronic engineer you can decide what you give the rider uh, yes it's not like a button where you go right okay 90 percent rider 10 percent electronics however um you can influence a lot how the bike runs how much power um my way has always been less of the electronics, more of a natural bike, um, and then let the rider do the rest. I've always said if it's too electronically driven, they want to do something different, then they can't. Um, you know, uh, I think of all the bikes, the Suzuki was the one which had the least electronics. Um, it was quite a natural engine, but obviously the cross-plane crankshaft is a little bit different. but. Yeah, I I prefer the rider can do what he wants with the bike and then it's sort of there in the background, catch a slide or... <laughs> Was that something that helped show Joanne at his best? That you could use the talent of the rider more than like turning electronics up a little bit? Um, I think if there was one thing with him that we did, um, and I did the same with DJ is the bike was quite natural so if they were in a battle with someone else they had a little bit more power because they had it in the hand um it's it's mainly the torque side and the tc side because you can set it in two different ways 
it's very easy to go very low, save the tyre, but it's a different thing to have a lot of power, the rider do it, then when he needs to, he can overtake, but then when he needs to save the tyre, he can, because that's the other thing, it's not 20 laps go as fast as you can anymore, you've got tyres that degrade quite quickly, um, it's quite natural with more power and everything and how quickly the races, the tyres degrade quicker. So um, there's always new things, you know, there's the, the tyre pressure things that are coming in now, which is the That's biggest. That's critical as well, isn't it? Because that affects podiums, race results. That probably is the most critical rule brought in in the last few years because it has such an effect after the race. Yeah, it's... I'm probably quite famous on social media because I don't like it. Uh, because I'm one of these people, I like to be in control, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. And it's the one thing I can't because, in fact, if anything, I have less sleep at night because I run through the races of what's going to happen because I'm trying to predict whether the rider's going to be in a group on his own. Um and they change a lot depending whether you are on your own or, or with a group. So, and we're talking, you know, to 0 0.2, 0 0.3 bar could be half a second a lap, which is over a race, it could be 10, 20 seconds. So it's the biggest headache and it's the biggest thing you can't control. You can go safe. Yeah. You can go safe and go, right, well, if that's the minimum on his own, I'll just put that in. The problem is if the rider's riding at two bar and you might, you know, you might as well pull in the pits because he's not going to do anything. It's impossible. It doesn't matter who he is. So there's also a lot at night now with uh, talking with the rider. Um, you're almost trying to plan the race between you, what's going to happen. So you set the pressures. There isn't that much strategy involved in the actual races now. That you, I mean, I've seen it. When, when you watch at the front and you see there's, there's times where Banyaya's waited or um, and just let the tyres come to him or not be in a certain position on the track at a certain time, it it, it doesn't feel, as you said earlier, as fast as we can for 20 laps. There's so much strategy involved in the first two thirds of the race so that the bike can be in its kind of optimum condition for the last third of the race, like Jorge Martin, how he can control his race. If you're away at the front, you're in your own world, aren't you? You can control what you do there. But if you have to work your way through... Yeah, you've got to be confident. Firstly, you've got to start on the front row. And second, you've got to be confident you get away um, to set everything as it is. Because if you don't and you have a bad start, in fact, we spoke for hours before the Saturday night before the Qatar race. Knew he had the fastest pace, knew DJ could win the race. But we had one problem and he struggles off the line and he always loses three, four places. Yeah. And like I said to him, I said, if I set you the pressure of you being on your own because you're going to win and you have a bad start, we've had it because you won't be able to overtake and go through and you've got a golden opportunity. So we discussed and I said, probably the best situation is you just sit behind to do 50% of the race or 75 just to make absolutely sure, make sure. So that way we can start with a little bit less with the pressures. Less means that when you're in the slipstream, the higher. Yes. And then you've got an opportunity to overtake. And then in the last few laps, you can overtake however i said by doing this do not go first because if you go first you'll be under and so we literally wrote the script of what was going to happen it's nice and very rarely you can because no, it doesn't pace. often do that does it it's motorcycle racing at the end of the day but... i don't think it's something you should have to do but unfortunately as it is at the minute until something changes you have to it's not it's not quite formula one but to actually have it takes away from the spectacle a little bit that you have to strategize a race rather than just whoever's fastest can go off and, you know, if you're fastest, go off and win it. Yes. Which I've, is the essence of motorcycle racing, isn't it? I've always been a believer like that. Um, it's like they say, those are the cards that you've been given. So you have to do it. I mean, 
we got away with quite a bit because we were like this in two or three races. And then unfortunately in the last one, um, Saturday, Valencia, we, it was with the front. Um, we were too much on the limit. So for the Sunday, we went a lot more, I think 0 0.2. Uh, and I said, don't worry, we've gone super safe like this. And then he did the whole race on his own until the last few laps where he caught everyone up. And I can remember watching the race going, Christ, you've done the whole race on your own. And then I saw someone from here to outside the box and I'm like, no, oh no. <laughs> so I knew, uh, I knew that we'd won. But the worst thing was we were like 0 0.01 and it, for one lap. And it's like, crikey. It's... Wow. The margins are incredible. Across all of MotoGP and, and the parameters that you work in, the the infin, infinitesimal margin, the point ones, your point zero ones, zero zero ones in a lot of cases. Yeah, I just don't. You're sort of in the in the middle at the moment. You either take a chance, safety of the rider, everything's normal and they're okay, or do you go the other way, super safe? You're going to be all right. And then you're not going to do anything unless you're first and whole shot. And if not, you're going to struggle. It's a proper roll of dice scenario. So it? we'll, we'll see. I still think this discussions because I don't think anyone's happy. No. I don't think any rider is happy. Um, you know, we just got to see. It's like anything. Sometimes you have to put the rules in, see what happens. I'm hoping from last year they can see the positive sides. Yes. In the, you know, I think the rear was really positive last year. I think they can see a lot of consistency. Um, it's the front, the, the front one, sure but yeah. needs it's, work. <laughs> it's almost, I don't know how much you enjoy the football. It's it's almost like VAR, and that you celebrate the win, you come back to pit lane, and they've gone. Sorry, no. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought. Do you know what I thought? That was good, and I was watching the uh, was it Egypt because they got knocked out. No, Morocco. Sorry, mm. and I think South Africa scored. And the goal should have been cancelled for an offside, but the VAR decided that it wasn't. I was like, well, okay, I thought I understood the system, obviously not. It's how it should work, but it doesn't have to. Maybe it went for a toilet break or something, I don't know. Where We'll come back on to your career. The, the, the MotoGP thing is, is fascinating. I don't want to keep you here longer than necessary because you've got so much to do. Um, where did you go after GSE? What was the, the career path after that? Uh, I got the opportunity to work with uh, Haga, with Ducati at uh, Renegade. Um, in fact, the the owner, Mark Griffiths, uh, I met him again after about 15 years uh, last year or the year before, because his daughter is with Sasaki. Oh, of course. Uh, and he manages Sasaki. So, uh, in fact, we've done a few flights together <laughs> recently, so we've been catching up. Uh, that was a um, great experience, incredible rider. Um, one of those weird things, because I think we won probably more races than anyone, but we had a lot of uh, DNFs due to a few technicals. Um, and then, yeah, after that, for family reasons, personal, I came back to BSB. Um, um, yeah, and then got to work with some good riders. Um, Lavia wasn't bad. <laughs> Championship? Yep. First year, they never saw a track. So uh, that was a good one. And then uh, obviously the 2009 with Leon Camier. Um, you always pray for a year like that, but um, not how it started, because that was probably the most stressful start I've ever <laughs> had. I don't think we started the bike until the night before the first round. People still don't believe it, but they won't do. That season was incredible. The the bikes they were were they Belgada? Yes, they were Yamaha. Bel, yeah. Belgada Yamahas, weren't they? And was that, was that the last or one of the last years of Magneti Morelli as well? Before it went to Evo and then they BSB started it going was down Magneti the Motec, Morelli, yes. Going down the uh, Motec route. But for, for Leon and for James Ellison as, as the other as a second rider, it yeah, was an incredible was... season. Like I said, the winter and the start was one of the most stressful because the bike had never even started before we even got to Brands. Um, in fact, I think we did a few all-nighters the Tuesday, Wednesday, just putting sensors on it. And then the first round, which was at Brands Indy, 
Um, it had a literally a stock frame, stock swing arm, like you buy on the in the shop. And I, again, people still don't believe it, but um, the engine was a road engine. The only thing was it was a proper electronic system. Yeah, still not running to the optimum because we just put it together. Um, and it was a case of start the weekend, right, first, let's see if it runs. And I think it stopped in the first session. Then um, it was a case of uh, when we saw, okay, it's not doing too bad, you know, maybe get a point or two points, every point counts. And then it went quite quickly from getting a point to maybe a top 10, top five. And then I think by Saturday night, we're like, Christ, could it really even get a podium? And then, yeah, race two, Leon won it. And it was like, okay, that's... <laughs> when you've got a completely stock bike, you're like, crikey, when everything else arrives. <laughs> and then I can't, I can't remember. I think there was, whether it was round two or three, and um, I think the frame and the swing arm arrived, and it was still a 170 horsepower engine you know you buy in the shop and i think he won by 15 seconds at alton park and we're like wow okay it's gonna be a good year and i think the only races he didn't win was because of i think he got disqualified with about three corners to go at cadwell for oil or something yeah <laughs> um an electronic at donington um yeah i don't i yeah it wasn't a bad year it was colin right as well wasn't it yeah Colin again. It, it, keeps, it comes around, doesn't it? It just comes around. I learned comes around. so much from Colin. You know, um, I lived quite close to him. So we he used to pick me up everywhere, drop me off. So I got to hear all the phone calls with the riders everywhere. <laughs> so I learned, you know, I've been in some really famous meetings with Colin. Like, um, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I remember a good one with Max Biaggi. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Um, but you, you know, he had so much experience, winning mentality, ruthless. So I got to learn so much from him. Um, not just the bike world, the riders, everything, the girlfriends of the wife, you know, it, was, it opened up quite quickly to a young kid, you know, I was only 21, 22 at the time. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Strange old world, isn't it? Yeah, it is a strange <laughs> old world. So I've got many years of that experience, which was, you know, which has yeah. helped me quite a lot. But that's what you can't buy. That's the thing of working of someone with, with, with Collins, not only his reputation and his success, but his work ethic. He was, from what I understand, he was, a hard man to work and ride for, but the rewards and working as a team far outweighed his, not, I was going to say tantrums, but they're not. Far outweighed his, his uh, huffing and puffing. Yeah, I think, I mean, if you got nearly out of it, I'm intrigued. But I'm sure any rider that's worked with him, if you asked who is the most ruthless or that, would say Colin, but yeah. probably if you asked who the best was, they'd also say Colin. So... I've not had anybody in the show that's had a bad word to say about him. No, there you go. <laughs> and that speaks for itself, especially in our, in our motorcycling world. It's, I mean, it, it says a lot. It's not the just man. the bike, about life, everything, you know, <laughs> even <laughs> student loans and all sports. He was like a secondary dad. He's a second dad. Time. Yeah, so. Um, a real pivotal time for you as well, both coming into a new environment in motorcycle racing and following the career path. You couldn't have had a better mentor, really. No, no, I'm, like I said, I got the winning ticket quite early. So, um, and like anything, a bit of success does help you, you know, when you're looking for other jobs, because it's not easy, as no. people always think, that you leave one place, go to another. You know, there's, um, like you said, there's one of you <laughs> for each part of the team. So um, you need success. If not, you're not going to find the next job or the That's next right. job. So um, for sure, he was pivotal, uh, especially in the early part of uh, my career. Is the one single big thing that you learned from him? 
<laughs> so I'm trying to think of something on bikes, but I'm thinking about... <laughs> um, that's why I didn't specify. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I had to go over speed bumps in South Africa <laughs> when you're sat in a boot. <laughs> well, yeah. funny you say that. The last question that I will ask you before we finish, that I ask every new guest that comes onto the show, is what's your best hire car story? So you can have that in the back of your mind before we get to the end of it. Oh, God. <laughs> not, not now. <laughs> we'll wait until we get to the end of that one. Right. That gives you a bit of a heads up anyway. Um, where from there? What happened after, after so that was 2009, wasn't it? Did you, did you go with Leon then? No. Um, the factory Yamaha called me um, and it was... I was ready then to go back to the world scene uh, and they asked me to go to World Superbike. So I worked in the factory team um, and uh, James Toesland was returning from MotoGP. Uh, I did two years there um, with James and then Eugene as a rookie. Um, of Probably the most frustrating was the end of 2011 because I've always had a thing where the second year I've worked with a rider, we've won a championship up. So we'd done everything. We were progressing, started winning races, did the double at Monza and it was like ready for the second year. And then curtains came down because Yamaha pulled out. Um, so that was frustrating because I'm sure Eugene would have been a world champion um, if it had done another year. I mean, the bike was incredible as well. Um, in fact, the <laughs> arguably one of the strongest teams I've ever had. I mean, there was Silvana Galbacera, Michele Gadda, who's head of all electronics in Yamaha MotoGP. There's the mechanics now in MotoGP, Yamaha, um, Ali G, who's Bautista, you know, it was Pete Bans of it, you know, the team was incredible level. Um, and then from there, uh, worked with Crescent um, to go with Leon, yeah. um, Paul Denning. Um, I had one of them finished years because we started from, you know, we were really, really struggling to start with, um, especially electronically everything, but the bike in general, you know, they'd stepped up to World Sewer Bikes. Um, and the most incredible thing was um, going from, I think, nearly getting lapped the first race to podiuming at the end of the year. And um, it's the first time started working on developing the bikes as well you know um we had a prototype with pete at the workshop that we were you know started from triple clamps and links and all sorts um wow. so worked quite a lot on development and then um yeah then i got a call from aspar and nikki hayden to because they needed someone to develop the electronics there so that was the one year I haven't crew chiefed in the last 19 years. Um, and then went to MotoGP and then realised it's a, you're with the big boys, definitely another level and everything. Um, and yeah, from there on, um, with Aspar, Carol Abraham, there was Bautista, uh, and then to Factory Suzuki with um, Mia, that didn't go too bad. Congratulations Until, on yeah. the championship. Yeah, thank you. And then, um, yeah, four incredible years. Then unfortunately, um, must be somewhere where I go, but they pulled the plug. Um, <laughs> There's a pattern for me. Yeah, for I know, ranking. I'm just starting to understand <laughs> that now. It's only when you go back through your career, you suddenly go, hang on a minute. <laughs> yeah, am I the bad apple here? Um, yeah. <coughs> That was a big shock because obviously it was a very tight fit yeah. team. Um, and then, yeah, Ducati gave me an opportunity to uh, work with them and could have been in a few different places or riders, but in the end, um, with a bit of movement and everything, it was uh, decided to go with DJ, which suited me perfectly, you know, because it was his second year and he was, you know, he struggled in the first year, but also from my point of view, it was better to have a rider like himself um, than someone going for a championship because I had to understand the bike. So 
was difficult for him, but it was also difficult for me because yeah, they are it's a motor GP bikes, but they're all completely different and it takes a while to actually understand something. Um then there's always that argument when a rider goes and does he bring his team and everything. It's a 50-50. There's understanding people on the personal level, but there's also understanding the bike. And, you know, I'm going to totally admit that it took me a while to understand it, not just, you know, how the engine works or the wheels go around, but how it physically works, What you, when you change something, it reacts in a different way to another one. It's... Um, you know, one or two millimetres on a Suzuki was quite a massive thing. You know, the, the Japanese would raise their eyebrows if you went three. I think if you said three to Gigi, you'd just go, all right, okay. <laughs> you know, it's different bikes, different concepts, different. Um, so you have to understand how they work. But also different, um, it is, it's that different work ethic as well, isn't it? You've, you've worked for the, the factory Japanese who have a very set way, it's the HRC, Yamaha, Suzuki, it's that Japanese way of working, it's small steps. But then you come to Ducati and you have a different way of working. What's been the biggest thing you've had to adjust to moving from Suzuki to Ducati? <laughs> I think the biggest thing is the meetings in the evening because with Suzuki, nine o'clock was 8.55, sat down, ready. The meeting would start at 8.58. Nine o'clock meeting with Ducati. I realised after about three or four rounds that I was the only one in there for about 10, 15 <laughs> minutes. I was like, oh, but some of the change the time or something. And then everything's a little bit different. Yeah, everyone has their own way. Yeah, yeah. So uh, obviously there's more riders, eight riders, you know, everyone's the management, GG, Ricardo, they'll be passing forwards to the next. But I think... Um, I think that's taking the joking aside. The having the eight riders and the data and everything is a is a different way to work because you have so much more information. I mean, it's not everybody has access to everybody's data. Not everyone has access to, within. I have levels. access. Yeah, uh, all the crew chiefs we have access. Ah, okay, uh, to all the other riders. So have all their data, all their electronics, everything. So um, you don't want riders setups. looking at other riders' data because <laughs> blow their mind. Well, <laughs> they're all different. You've got the ones that will come in two minutes before the session, and they'll have a look at a few graphs. And um, you know, Joanne, you can look at a couple of graphs um, after the session. Maybe in the morning, you'd come and have a little look, but. Unless there was something important or someone was faster. DJ loved, you know. It's all right, I've got it. Yeah. It's all right. Um, eight riders is a lot with him because he <laughs> likes to look at all the riders. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a lot. You know, he'd still be in his leathers an hour and a half after this session. He's like, yeah, you do know on a Saturday that qualifying starting in about 10 minutes, you, you, you know, I need, I need to do some work if you want to go forward. <laughs> Um, he, they're all different. Yeah. Um, my current rider now um, he just wants to know who's going. If there's a rider that's going faster, where it is, that's it. <laughs> that's easy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's so easy. They're all different. What was Nicky Hayden like to work with? I mean, we, he, he's massively missed across the sport, but having a, an opportunity to work with him at Aspar and, and work with the, the world champion. Amazing. Um, Arguably, the rider that made me make the biggest step in work preparation and information, everything, because Nikki was a. Uh, so I said DJ was liked information. Well, Nikki was. I think he was quite famous in the paddock. He was quite demanding on what he wanted and everything. Well, actually, it brought me up to another level because you used to have to print 50 sheets after every session. You know, he want, it wasn't just show him on a graph. Um, his assistant, Nick, would come, get the pack, take it to his motor home, he'd analyse it, then come back, we'd talk through it. So there was a hell of a lot of uh, other side of the work, preparation, 
planning. He wanted to, you know, all the meetings, meeting every evening, every session with the Michelin guy, the Olin's guy, everything was prepared, planned. How many exits, how many laps? Uh, it was quite meticulous. Um, you could see with Nicky there was incredible talent. Uh, you could also see that he was struggling already with his wrist from the injury. Um, but, um, yeah, I remember... I don't think I've seen another rider faster than him through fast left-hand corners, obviously with his history and what he used to ride in America, but he had an incredible talent. Um, but yeah, just one of those, um, you know, you used to always say with your CV, you know, you used to put it on, it was high on there and because it's an incredible opportunity. Um, yeah, it'll always be missed because actually... We ended up going quite close together. Yeah. In fact, uh, when he went to her World Superbikes, we were still texting, communicating. So it was a awful tragedy when uh, when the news broke out. Very difficult time, and especially as you get so close, it's a, it's a loss for fans, but for family and for crew and for the team, it I can't even imagine what it's like to be in that situation at all, and you don't want to. No, I mean, it's, what are your biggest worries? Um, arguably, not arguably, it is whenever you do anything or whatever you do, it's the safety of the rider that is number one. There's no taking short measures or anything. You know, I'm even quite hard on the rider sometimes. Um, you know, I think the airbags can go off a couple of times now, can't they? Yeah, uh, and they come in, they, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, they come in and they're all scuffed and wrecked, and they go, "Oh no, no, I've got another one." And I'm like, "The office is upstairs. Go and put another set of leathers." And um, because it is a horrible area, but all you can do is just make sure everything's right, safety, and I think that's going back to other things like tire pressure and everything else. It is quite stressful because. That's another area. Everything is an area on the safety of the rider. Um, it's not go as fast as possible, but it's bloody dangerous. It's it is your number one, well, number one thing. On the, on a, on a brighter note, what tell me about the the World Championship season and developing Joanne from a, a MotoGP rookie and actually having that um, that path of being being part of that journey from sitting him on the bike for the first time, making sure the bars and the pegs, everything's where it needs to be, to lift in the MotoGP World Championship at the end of the following season. It was a crazy first two years because um, I think the first race he was fighting for the win at Qatar. Uh, it's always been a good race of mine, a specialist track anyway. But what he did was incredible for a rookie. Then you sort of, you have to remember again, uh, this is what I was saying about pre-season testing and everything. You tested for three days there and then you race. So for a rookie, and it will be the same this year, so you got to take with a pinch of salt what rookies do in their first race at Qatar because you've got two days testing before the race. And it makes a massive difference. So it's a completely different ball game when you yeah. get to another track, 20 laps, bang, qualifying mode. So Joanne had that luxury of the test. First race, incredible. And everyone's like going, wow. You know, this hasn't been done since God knows how many years, 20, 30 years. And then you go to round two. Whoa, one of the hardest race tracks because it's all about tyre life and how you manage a tyre. And he absolutely, you know, I don't think I've seen a rider since he reached over 200 degrees with a tyre in one lap on his out lap. And, uh, you know, I think there was discussion of it being a bad tire and everything. It was like, wow. Well, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Two, two, it was 200 degrees in one lap. But if, I mean, he jokes about it since, and his, the photographs when you see the smoke and, you know, he absolutely battered it. And um, from then to halfway through the year was... Wasn't a disaster, but it was a big learning curve. And it almost took that time for him to go, right, step it back a little bit. 
uh, finish the races, understand. It was almost like that first race had given him something that wasn't quite... It's that false confidence. Yeah, almost. false confidence, exactly. Um, and then uh, there was a test at Bruno. And that was the first moment we actually really had an opportunity to change the bike for him and understand. He'd had half a year's experience, so um, he knew how the bike reacted, everything. So yeah. you can then, I always say, half a year, then you can make the bike more for the rider. And um, there was just one famous, we moved him. We had this idea of something that we could do with him. Uh, so we completely changed his riding position. And he went first, came in and went, that was horrendous. And we went, we were all expecting him to go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he went, that was horrendous. And we went, oh, but he went faster. I know, he says, but don't like it. I want to go back. So, what? Yeah. So we put all the position back and he went like half a second slower again. And he came in and he, you could see he was confused. And it was him and he goes, can we go back again? I, I just need to check. And he went and did another time even faster than he was first. And he came in and I could see he was never used to leave his helmet on that long. And he was, I can remember him like trying to understand what the hell had just gone. And he, and I'm going to be honest, he says, I feel awful, uncomfortable, everything. But he said, the lap time's easy. Yeah. So I don't understand. And then um, that was the first moment followed what happened later in that test because he had that awful um, technical issue. So he crashed at over 200 mile an hour, which then messed the season up because yeah. uh, he couldn't do the next races. Um, and he wasn't fully fit until coming back for 2020. But in that time, you then see the progression you want to do. So it was your top tens to top eight, seven, sixth, fifth, and then every race was slightly better. Um, so when you going into 2020, um, that we, I'm not going to say win the championship, but we were going to be hoping to compete for at least top five. Um, and then the craziest thing was the after the COVID and everything, the first race where he crashed um, was the first time I went, wow, we have actually got incredible race pace. But, we, you know, he got, got to, taken out. Got to build, build the bike again, but we know he's fast. Yeah. Then um, <laughs> Hereth's always a funny thing. Where you start, you finish. You just can't overtake there in the heat. Um, and it was ridiculous. I think it was 60 degrees track that year. Then he got taken out by Laquena at round three. So we were pretty much 20 in the championship in a very short year. But it was weird. And it was Bruno that the everything clicked and everything changed with him because we, Brad Binder won that race, uh, but we had probably the fastest race pace. And Bruno was also about saving tyres. However, he was so saving the tyres in the first two, three laps that he lost seven, eight positions, got taken by Laquena into the penultimate last left, came in and went, never going to happen again. He said, to be with, you know, riding at the back with them, save it. No. Nah. says, next race. says, I'm going to look after my tyres, but when I go, I'm going to go. And that was it. And uh, I think we then went to Red Bull Ring, wasn't it? And um, yeah, it was once he'd got the first podium, then it was the monkey. It was the monkey off the back, wasn't it? That yeah. was it. You can do it now. Go we and knew do the it. pace was there, but yeah. it was just lining the stars and everything. A little bit like last year with DJ, there was pace earlier, but the stars weren't aligned. The starting position wasn't great. And then, with, yeah, with Joanne, I mean, our starting position was horrendous every race. We tried everything. I think it took till 2021 to actually understand something about that. But Didn't you go the full season without starting on the front row? Does that, is that something I've just dreamt of? No, no, that's... I'm sure our average 
starting position is the worst in the history of MotoGP. For a champion? For a champion. Yeah. I think it's like 11th, 12th or it's something horrendous. I'm sure that's, that's stuck in my mind that it's the, the first ever world champion never to start on the front row in, in any of the races. Yeah, I think the best was the one he won when we started second row. Which is a fascinating way of looking at it. Especially nowadays, you have to start on the front row if you want to have a, a chance. Yeah, well, like, for sure my weakest point is qualifying. Because I think in the last five years, I've finished lower than my starting position two or three times in about 70, 80 races. So you can arguably go, I'm very good at race tyres, or I am terrible <laughs> at qualifying. Yeah, um, what would you rather be, though? Yeah, but crikey. <laughs> I know the rider maybe isn't ideal on that front. When they, they, they never won. had a pole in MotoGP. Never, in fact, I can count on one hand front rows. Um, I have a suspicion that might change this year. <laughs> well, if he doesn't, then we'll know that it's definitely <laughs> me. No, no. He's, I, if he I, can't I, do it. <laughs> in fact, I, the, the, going back to DJ, I said to him at Qatar, I said, you know, we haven't finished lower than we started. And when he started second... Just as you can only win. It's all you can do. That's your bottom line, so, mate. That's it. So uh, no pressure, Ditch, but that's what you've got to do. How how much of a different journey was that with Digia for the season compared to Joanne and what you'd done with him to then come into Digia in his second season? Who was who he was lost, wasn't he? Let's I think it's fair to say after his first season, it, it was a very, very difficult first season with the um not the reputation, but with, with the promise that he came into the class with after Moto2 and his time in, in Moto3. But he, he kind of looks a little bit lost at the end of his first season, then joins up with yourself and then you start to see incremental improvements from sort of mid-season onwards once you get to know each other. Is that fair? Yeah, I think there was a lot of things that were extremely harsh. Um, you have to remember the, you know, the double world champion Peko Banyaya, he struggled the first few years, you know, uh, and he came off winning the Meta 2 world championship. Yeah, so, absolutely, yeah. So, um, Luca Marini really struggled. Yeah, you can say the bike has improved a little bit, um, or quite a lot, <laughs> but they struggled. And, you know, DJ said it a few times, God, you know, it took them two, three years. Why am I not allowed two, three years? Because already... So, <clears throat> it was difficult. And you want to make the progression as quickly as possible. Don't get me wrong. But the worst thing in the world is progressing by having one incredible result. And then the next one, year 20th. And you don't understand why, because nothing worked. The most important thing is that every weekend gets better it doesn't matter what track whether it goes left whether it goes right or and that was the thing what he did yeah it was took time but took time because top tens weren't you know if you got top tens the year before you'd have been, it'd have been really happy um but all of a sudden top tens weren't good enough um and then It wasn't that the penny dropped at Mandalika because I think that was his first top, top result, which yeah. was the fourth top independent. Um, we do a little thing where you see lap pace, average pace, average split sectors. And we could see from uh, it was Silverstone because he, Jorge Martin knocked him off the track and was completely last. Yeah. And um, he actually closed on Banyaya, who won the race. Um in the following 10 laps. Um, result didn't look great, especially when he came in for wrecked tyres because, you know, he saw rain that no one else did. <laughs> you know, um, bless him. I understand. It's England. You know, it's it's going to rain at some point. <laughs> he was like, come on, come on. This is my <laughs> moment. I think he was waiting for one spot. He got one spot and uh, I thought, this is my moment. But yeah. Roll the dice. If it had seen what we did and stayed out, he probably would have caught the leaders. Yeah. But that was the first time you could see it. And then Assen was tough. The pace was there, but you start fourth, fifth row. 
And it was always the same thing, that the pace was there, but you're starting way, way too far back. And then um, you need a bit of luck. And at Mandalika, the race spread out very, very quickly. So if you have pace and the tyres hadn't gone through the roof, which they hadn't, he was able to work his way through um, and was the fastest on track. So you knew it was there. And then, like we said, to get your first podium and everything is all about starting first or second row. Um, and that's what he did at Australia, um, Qatar, and uh, even Valencia, he wasn't too far away. It wasn't. Not too far away means for him starting eighth and not 20th or... Um, so it was it was a nice progression, but you know we we did see it earlier. It just takes time for everything to click into place. You know, it's not just lap time, one lap. Where do you finish? Um, how you doing tests? Like I said, in tests, anybody can be fast in tests because you do so many laps. Um, it's when you go, you know, not even Qatar uh, because obviously we test there. So when being two, you go to Portimao and you get uh, 45 minutes, 25 laps, 24 laps, FP1, and then FP2, you've got to go like a bat out of hell. And that is not one easy place to... Q1, you know. Q2, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, because only 10 go through. So... Um, wow. And it dictates your weekend. And now there's two races. So a bad qualifying, and that's not one race you've screwed up. That's two. So it's... But that's when you know, when you can go out FP1 and you're fast. How has the schedule, uh, how have you adjusted to the schedule, having a, a now a race on a Saturday, a race on a Sunday, 20 rounds from March to November? It's, uh, uh, we have some, a lot of our listeners and viewers, they, they know the sport, they understand it. That, I can't imagine, well, it starts this weekend. It's, Early February to the last test at November before you, you have like six weeks off and then you're back on it, or six weeks off and you're back on it again. It I can't imagine the intensity that that's having. How, how are you adjusting to that? Um, I think everyone's quite honestly struggling. Um, every team's different. Um, MotoGP, satellite, less personnel. It's extremely tough um again each bike is a little bit different but you know we watch all the races with the riders from the year before and you always look the same you can't tell much different everything but i'll tell you what i've noticed <laughs> noticed in this last year it's like pretty hell i've aged a lot in one year and it's like, oh, like next year i'll be like gandalf or someone else <laughs> Because it takes so much out of you. Yeah. Um, you've got to prepare for the time attack straight away, FP2. Um, FP3, you've almost got to work on race setup, but you can't crash because you've got qualifying straight after. Um, again, qualifying, you're now for a sprint race. You can't, well, a crash there, it takes, you know, Unfortunately, I had the rider that crashed the most in FP3, which was the worst time. Um, because they're not easy, these bikes. You know, once upon a time, in a half an hour, an hour, you could rebuild one. But, you know, you have a crash in the sprint race or anything, you are, you know, you might as well bring your pillow into the, to the garage because it's a long, long night. And um, it's not just that. There's more information. Um once upon a time, you had a few graphs, you'd look, a few sector times, are you faster, slower? Now, there's so much analysis, there's so much analysis in tyres, reports, um, it takes it out of everyone. Um, not just me, but no, also, no. you know, the, the, the mechanics. Um, you've got a race on Saturday and Sunday, so it's not just put a race engine in on a Saturday night, so that's one engine change. you now got to do it on a Friday night as well as a Saturday night because you've got a sprint race because, um, you know, you have to do everything for the maximum performance. So if the maximum performance on a Friday night is to 
change it for a Saturday and you know it's it's tough a lot lot tougher how I mean <coughs> that for me is is something as, as, as a from a layman's perspective and from viewing from the outside of MotoGP to us it's the same bike all weekend and it couldn't be further from the truth in terms of engine. If, if you're going to change it, you got different. What do you have an allocation of? Is it six? Seven. Seven. Uh, and eight, I think, if you do 20 races, I can't remember the number 20, 21. So you don't run one to its mileage, swap it, next one to its mileage, then rotated through the. the wow. I can't go into technical. Everyone will have their own way. Yes, of course. Um, As a general overview, The key is, is it's a machine. Um, they will optimise at a specific moment. I can't say how many kilometres you can do with it, but um, it's all about maximising performance. So if kilometres A is the maximum performance and you need that for the Saturday race and then you need B for Sunday yes. race, you have to do that and it takes you know um i did something which i don't normally ever do but i did it at a race last year he won so i'm not complaining <laughs> but we he had a favored bike favored frame yeah. um it's not easy for me to say you can't see a single thing but they're the ones that sit on it and say no no i like that one um so we changed the engines for this you know, from one bike to the other bike, so that he had the best engine, best frame, best mileage. Sounds like an easy change. Take two engines, and yeah. But I think we were there till one o'clock in the morning. To yeah, it's a, there's a hell of a lot of it that goes into it. But um, that's what you're there it's for. Kind of what you sign up for, isn't it? Yeah. In the night, you, you know, you're not clocking off at six o'clock and heading off to hospitality, and that's it for the day. No, it's great when that happens. It's <laughs> if they barrel roll it into turn one and you're like, yeah, that was a good word of eight hours. And to be fair, my boys uh, were brilliant yeah. and they were, um, you know, they're the same. I think it's a job. You do it, you get paid, you pay the bills. But there's the other half that um, you're all there because you love the sport, you know. Um, so it's not a case of uh, wake up, Nine o'clock, finish five, right, five o'clock, gone. There is no time, you know. I've left the track at eight, half eight at night. I've left the track at three in the morning. Back through the gate at half You seven. do what you need to do. There's no, yeah. you don't get a bonus because you've stayed an extra hour. Is it? You get the bonus of standing on top of the podium. <laughs> You're getting the rider up there. Or the, mm, that would be nice. Well, the kudos, <laughs> the kudos, the kudos, I'll give you that. <laughs> you know, the podium bonuses and things like that. That's the, the rider's world, isn't it? <laughs> How difficult is a MotoGP bike to ride compared to a World Superbike compared to a BSB bike? I mean, from a riding point of view, I can't, I'm not the rider, so I can't really, I can tell you from a technical exactly. point from what I see. Yeah. Um, they are super, super stiff, long, stiff, um, you need temperature in the tires to work. You need temperature in the discs to work. Um, and they're quite cutthroat. They're designed to work in specific operating settings and everything. You go out the window and they don't work. Um, uh, I think you see a lot of people with uh, Moto2 actually that go to Supersport. Moto2 is brutal. They, they are awful bikes. They are so rigid. In fact, you see now that uh, Moto2 riders that jump to MotoGP seem to progress pretty quickly. Um, and I think for that reason, they are built like a GP bike. They're stiff. They are... So they go to... You've seen them go to super sport yeah. and then they just clear up. Uh, and I think, you know, Bulig has struggled. Um, he went to world super sport and, you know, he could have ridden with one hand. He was, uh, they're just different bikes. They're more flexible. Um, 
to go the other way, I think, is a hell of a lot harder. A lot, lot harder. Um, I think partly with how the classes are done, the organisers want the guys that go into GP to have a realistic opportunity because once yes. upon a time, you needed years and years. Whereas now, I think that's the thing. You've got to hit the ground running, haven't you? Pretty yeah. much. And amongst 26 of the fastest riders in the world. They're all world champions. Good luck. Yeah. It's an incredible way. Speaking of Moto2, that bring, brings us to, like, it's a nice little segue into rider management and looking after Jake. That's been a, a journey and a, and a half with him, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just been incredible in the sense that when he first started with uh, Lee, helped out, uh, they wanted to put an extra rider. Uh, we've just, you know, just been good friends. Um, Sarah, some other call me Uncle Frankie, which is nice. Um, I've just always had their best interest. Um, people say manager and everything. It's just uh, I've always just helped him. Yeah. Just uh, I saw a lot of talent in him as well. You don't know how far he goes. I knew he'd go far. Um, we don't know how far he'll go because I don't think um, he's still. Pete, it's, it's very different. Uh, people have to remember there's a big thing about age and everything. It's like Troy Bayliss. How old was he when he first started riding? Did, you, we come from different uh, different backgrounds, different cultures, so it's, it's, it's physically impossible. You get an 18-year-old from the UK riding a motor two bike. Impossible. 100%. Not in my lifetime, it'll no. happen. Um, I mean, that's another story, what needs to change. That's, so That's a whole podcast on yes, its own, exactly. that, Frankie. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't get me started on that. So We'll save that for later in the year. <laughs> it's just been great to see the progression yeah. uh, and quite quickly got him to the World Championship, which was nice. And yeah, to see him last year winning races and um, he's incredible and deserves everything. It's going to challenge for the championship this year, no doubt about that. The continuity, the, the continuity of the team, and the network that he has. What do you see after that? Do you do you see MotoGP? Do you see potentially a switch to Worlds? Because the only reason I ask is that in the time that Jake's been in Moto2, Augusto Fernandez has been and gone. Pedro's been and gone. Now Pedro is an incredible talent, and he's um, a potential alien in that respect but there are riders that have sort of come through and jake just hasn't quite had that opportunity to go into the big class yet would you suggest that that's becoming less likely because of the the, the spanish and the italians coming through it's like I, I go back to where you come from the route you come through um it's how the system is uh you have a young Spanish rider, I think it's like uh, Piqueras who wouldn't I yeah. admire him. I was watching him all last year. He is a special talent. Red Bull Rockies champion. Yep. Uh, and he's going to jump straight into Leopard. So even if he struggles, he's going to be top 10 because of the team he's in. Yes. Um, it's not to take anything away. Someone like Pedro is a special talent, for sure. Um, but some of these riders have nice stepping stones and it makes can take years off. Um, takes years off moving each of step to the yeah. next one. So it helps. You know, a British rider isn't going to jump into the Aspar Moto3 or the KTM no. Moto3 or the Leopard. It's not going to happen. Agreed. They've got to stand out and hopefully one of them picks them up and takes them. Um, and then the same going into Moto2. Um, you know, looking at previous world champions, Aki's won God knows how many of the last five or six. Um, doesn't mean they go to MotoGP and they're going to be world no. beaters. Uh, but, you know, he's a friend of mine and he does an incredible job, but he obviously does something right because anyone who's jumped on that bike goes... Very, very they're all race, they're all, if they're not world champions, they're race winners on a regular basis. Yeah. So 
Um, Jake's in a great team. Uh, I used to be at Aspar, so I know them very yeah. well. Um, they got their first ever wins in Moto2 with the, with the Triumph. So they are on an upward spiral. So Jake, uh, Jake doesn't have the luxury of some of the others. So he has taken more years because he didn't even know the tracks. No, absolutely. Some of the others have, you know, they've ridden around Portimao, Jerez, Montmelo we since didn't they were 10 doing years old. Three for two seasons, just to at least no. know which way the tracks go. Exactly. So, you know, there was, a, there was a thing I noticed with Jake in his third year when he suddenly started podiuming. They were all uh, in uh, international circuits. So... Your Malaysia's, your Philip Islands, uh, America, um, and for me, there was a very clear reason that um, his level of knowledge of the tracks is similar to the others, and then he can showcase his, what he does. So, I have no doubt he's improved every single year. He'll do the same this year, and changing to new tyres, I think that's going to be the biggest difficulty for everyone. Pirellis, uh, aren't they? Yeah, but changing to Pirellis, not the BSB Pirellis, but the tyres always uh, throw a spanner in the works. A major factor for a motorcycle. <coughs> yep, yeah, it was for somebody somewhere that's always struggled. He'll, he'll have got the uh, the golden ticket. <laughs> There's somebody, somebody will have one somewhere. Um, what have we got? These okay. What's been your most memorable moment throughout your whole career? Oof. I think well it has to be the the, the motor GP world some shit. I did wonder because there's there's two ways of looking at it. It might be it might be a certain rider reaching a certain potential, it might be the world championship, it might be something clicking with you as a as a data engineer and suddenly go, yeah, that's why we do this. I'm not trying to take it away from the answer. That's the one I expected. It's a tough one because I think each one is their own special from even back to the first year with winning the British Championship um, with Neil. Um, they're all special in their own way. Um, all different achievements. Um I think just purely because it's the highest you can possibly do, the one yeah. with uh, with Joanne. Change that question slightly then. What's your most satisfying moment? <laughs> that gives you a different pro a different perspective. Um, Maybe even the most recent one with DJ at Qatar, um, just because um, different circumstances, different. Yes, oh, maybe, maybe that one, or maybe actually the Crescent one, uh, for the same reasons. Yeah. Um, when you start quite low and you're struggling in the course of a season from to go from in DJ's case last every session at Portimao to first uh, and they say with Crescent where we really really struggled to go to podiuming um, um, is a special thing because it means you've had you know you're not just put tires and fuel and you've had to do something to, to make a difference. Just so, digging deep and yeah, to do that. It's just a different aspect. So, um, yeah. I can tell you the most amusing one. Go on. Mallory Park 2009. Okay. Because this is when you know your looks in. I can't, God, maybe I am wrong, but I'm sure... Because of all the races, I think Leon won 23 in that year. Yeah. But there was a race at Mallory Park and Leon got taken out in the first corner, so he was dead last. And I think the airwaves Ducati riders were like seventh and eighth with one lap to go. 
and they finished first and second. I don't know if you remember. That's incredible. Josh had an unfortunate incident into the... Oh, he did. The, that, that meeting. The hairpin of the bus stop. Because he was on the right-hand side of the track yeah. where the dip was. And, and he'd not crashed. been all weekend. Yeah. And couldn't break in time for the corner. Yeah. So, and I, I'm, I think... Take out Chris Walker, Simon Andrews. Michael Walter. Yeah, was, I'm sure there were seventh and eighth or something like that. And they finished first and second. And we're like, crock, you know your looks. <laughs> Did Carl Harris get third? I can't remember. Something like that. I can't remember. There was something ago, yeah, I don't, I mean, He was riding for Rob Mack maybe at that point. I can't remember. But yeah, that, that was one of those Brooksy moments that... I mean, it, it can off the back to of, anyone. It's, uh, it's it just, oh, no, he oh, no, can. I'm not pointing a finger because he explained it on another podcast. He said he'd not been on that part of the track all weekend, didn't realise there was a dip, went for the back brake and his back wheel's in the air because he'd gone over the kicker and he just couldn't stop. And it, that's... I've done some bits a moment ago, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I think I can't remember the result. I think I, my biggest memory was Jack Valentine when he was getting off his chair. He was livid, wasn't he? Yeah. I remember that plain as day. He was absolutely livid. That's the sign where people are like, whoa. But yeah, I'll tell you, the great memories. They was, uh, yeah. Good times everywhere, isn't it? One question that I've asked Spanner, and I thought of it while we were just sat with him, and I've asked the same of, of Mark Woodage recently, and this in no way questions a crew chief's integrity right <laughs> this this is just a genuine this is a genuine question for any rider in all the time that you've been doing the job has asked you to make a change that's so in so small that you know that it wouldn't make any difference have you told him you've made it but you haven't the placebo effect Now, I've never told them I've done a change and not done it. If they've asked for it and you've said yes, but not done it because you know it doesn't if make a lot of difference. If they've asked for it yeah. and I haven't done it, yeah. I would have told them I haven't done it. Right. As I say, it's not questioning no, integrity. Never, it's just sometimes... I've that... always been on... I've, there's an element of real trust. You break that bond or trust. It's better to fall out and go, no, not doing it than do it and... No, that's fair. Um, I think the only thing I've ever even... Sorry, everything seems to go back to 2009. <laughs> was... Uh, it was a special season, mate. A qualifying session and just for a joke, because I think we he'd already won the championship then. Um, when he came in for qualifying, we made a joke that to, because there was this famous thing. I don't know if you ever saw people like pushing on seat units and everything or forks and going right. And he's, so Leon came into the pit lane and as a joke, got onto the back, pushed it down and went right, two clicks and pretended to change <laughs> two clicks. And then he got a pole position. Everyone was going, whoa, what do you think? <laughs> That's placebo. That's the same sort of thing. What That's, a game. I mean, it was a bit of a special year, so you could do those sort of things. But that just that's the com- only that time bred confidence, ever. didn't it? That was the best thing about it. Um, who's been your most engaging rider in terms of understanding your role and what you give in terms of data, in terms of crew chief? I think all in their own way. Um, Probably the one who understood me most because he used to ring me at two o'clock in the morning occasionally was Greg Lavia. He knew I'd still be up. <laughs> Frankie, I've been thinking. <laughs> like this. Um, <laughs> Just like <laughs> Yeah, I don't think anyone... No, that's fair. Um, I've got a couple of stories that we'll finish off with, but let's let's talk about 2024. You have a new rider for 2024, Mark Marquez. You had the, the test at Valencia after the final round. How was that from your seat? Um, probably leading up to it for half an hour, I was a little bit nervous, if I'm honest. And in the sense that you, you're working for the previous year, so you don't even think about it. Then you arrive to the garage for the test, 
and then you realise you can't get into the garage because there's about 200 reporters all out, and you're like, whoa. <laughs> okay. We've arrived. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in that moment, you're like, oh, God. <laughs> um, and then as soon as it started, you just go back to being normal again. Um, and then again, yeah, they open the garage door and there's another 200 people outside just to remind you. But now, in all honesty, um, people have taken a lot into the test. Um, it was very special conditions. It was awful. It was really windy. It was cold. Some people probably pushing a little bit. Some people, you know, testing a few parts. I've been there. We're in a factory team. What you do is test parts. You don't even do laptops. So you can't... In fact, if anything, more frustrated because there was certain things you wanted to do. Finding positions, a few settings, but you couldn't because the conditions were so bad. In fact, the only thing we changed on the bike was uh, for the wind, just because we wanted him to do as many laps. And that's the other thing. Um, I think Mark's joked about it, that he normally goes into a Valencia test and he's got like four or five bikes. He had one bike. And do you know how stressful it is that there isn't a problem, a technical problem, a crash or, you know, because you need to do every lap possible to get as much information. So that was also really tricky because you're like, you know, you're just worried something's going to go wrong. Um, so it was good to get information, but it's almost like, okay, good, ridden, but there's not really... You can pick a few things up, but not really too much. I'm trying not to ask questions that you can't answer because it's not fair. <laughs> um, because, because from the Grassini perspective, from MotoG perspective, from Mark's perspective and yours, there, there are things, I guess, the things that you've seen on the data from those first 30 odd laps that I would hope give you um, a sort of a raised eyebrow. But was it too soon to to get an, an idea? Because it was it just turning laps. What was the, the sort of the general premise for the test? Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Familiarization. That's the word I'm looking for. I think that's all you can take out of it. You can pick up styles uh, without going into details, but how you use the gas, how you use the brake, front rear brake combination. Um, you you get an idea and you pick it up, um, but you know I could even see that he was riding at a limit that enabled him to do a half decent lap time without taking too many chances. Um, I mean the whole bike was so soft for the wind just because it was, I think you noticed in the first few laps, he kept going off on turn one because that was the wind. It yeah. was terrible. Um, so it was just familiarization, but not just familiarization uh, with him with the bike, him with me, him with the mechanics, the team in general. Um, you know, he went smooth, excuse me, a bit of my tongue. It went smoothly considering. Yeah. Um, but... We will see yes. in a few days. <laughs> That's it. You're, you're reunited tomorrow with the team and with Mark. The, the one thing that sticks out from the, the, the last point we'll make on that, when he came in after his first run, that smile. <laughs> a, a lot's been made of it, but he doesn't smile for no reason. <laughs> what did you make of it? I'll be honest, at the time, I didn't even acknowledge the smile or anything. It wasn't until we packed up and I was looking through Twitter or something and I was like, what? It's everywhere. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the back of your head. And Every Mark's other smile. Me and then how many messages? And I was like, okay. I, I, honestly, I didn't at the time even acknowledge it. Um, it's only afterwards. And, he just had a good chat with his dad at the presentation and everything, and he's everyone will see him in a different way. 
he's just a young lad, very fast young lad, just wants to be fast, win races, compete at the top. Um, so the first thing is to smile and enjoy what you're doing. Get the if fun you do, back in it. Get the fun, exactly. And if he's enjoying himself, the rest will come. But um, <laughs> in fact, it's the one thing I said to his dad, the one thing I'll do is that he enjoys himself and has a laugh. What happens afterwards, maybe in a year or six months, we'll know. But um, the first thing is, is um, he's just a kid that really enjoys riding a bike. Um, he's lost a little bit of fun. Uh, he's had some horrendous injuries and other stuff going along. So at the moment, he just wants to enjoy himself. And I think, you know, there is almost no better place. Grassini's very professional. Um, it's a very family, um, family sort of orientated team. And his brother's there and, you know, I think at the minute they're just enjoying themselves. So all these questions, there are a lot of questions, rightly wrong, I don't know. Um, but I think they're going to enjoy themselves and we'll see how far the enjoyment goes. <laughs> it's difficult to predict the season. There's so many variables. And I know as, as a data engineer and a crew chief and ones and zeros, <laughs> there's, there's no prediction. You're going to take it race by race and develop through it. You're going to say he's going to, there's so many people saying he's going to, nobody's going to see which way he went. It's going to be this, that and the other. But you have a, I know you have a 180 view on that completely. Or, all you can do is, I've always, probably my biggest philosophy is improve. So whatever round one is, round two is better. And so on and so on and so on. Um, Always been sort of in mind. Who knows where we start? Um, obviously, the higher you start, the better chances you have for the future. But you don't know where that will be. And as amazing anyone can be, um, new team, new bike, going against someone who's just won two world championships on that bike, and it has the next back, you know. <laughs> There's a lot to think about. There is. I agree um, completely. It's not everything straightforward. It's not cotton dry, not by a long shot. My, my plan with him at the moment is get the first few races, as much experience, and just learn. Because um, I have to understand what he wants to go fast. He has, he has to understand what he needs from the bike to go fast. You know, at the moment, it's, we've no idea. And how you work together, he worked with Santi Hernandez for so many years. And it, so it's a completely different um, synergy for both of you. So that doesn't yeah, happen exactly. overnight. That's not going to happen by the end of Sepang. No, That's no, exactly. going to be three, four, five rounds in. And then it'll start to gel. And then you understand the rider. Rider understands you. And then you go to the next step, is my interpretation. No, no, absolutely. Um, like I said, it's not just one change. It's the whole thing is changing. Mm. Sometimes you have a group, the whole group goes to another manufacturer. It's a bit easier because you understand what the rider wants. Uh, you just have to learn the bike. In his case, he has to learn the bike. He has to learn the team. There's quite a lot. It's like I said, even with me, myself last year, it took me time yeah. to understand the bike. So it won't be any different for him. Um, it's going to be a fascinating year. Yeah. that's the. I think that's the bottom line, isn't it? It's going to be a fascinating year for, for you and for the team, but it's fun. That's going to be the best thing about it. And there's going to be a lot more reporters and TV cameras in your, in your box than there's been for, since the uh, Suzuki days. <laughs> I said to him at the presentation after we'd finished, because I was desperate for a gin and tonic, and it was about 11 o'clock, and I went, I'll tell you what, I said, there's one thing I can guarantee, by the end of this year, I'll be very good at doing interviews. <laughs> yeah, so speaking of gin and tonic, what story does that bring me on to? <laughs> <laughs> some of your be I'm reliably informed that some of your best decisions are made in that little hour um, recess 
that you have of an evening <laughs> with a gin and tonic and you come up with all sorts of things. I'm reliably informed. Um, some work, some Well, from the work point of view, <laughs> I have, well, the days are so long now yeah. that I, half seven, eight o'clock, and even half eight, when we go for dinner, uh, I'll stop for a, a good hour and a half. Yeah, might have a beer, a gin and tonic, relax, chill, and then um, go back to the hotel and then I'll start again. Um, because you've got to remember, you've gone, you've been at the track since seven o'clock in the morning, so you've already done 13, 14 hours. So uh, for two reasons. One, um, I've always had this thing with my side of the garage and team that we also have a general chit chat about the day, what you can do, because it's not just my ideas. I also, you know, someone might say, Christ, do you remember when we did that? It, Dassin or whatever, and I go, yes. Yeah. Or, so there's always things. And sometimes rather than looking at a computer screen for 15 hours nonstop and just looking at lines and going, right, I haven't got a clue, you do get... The old spitballing. Exactly. And I know what you want to... <laughs> about a bomb what, May. What's that, what, what's that Frankie? <laughs> Frankie Cartini, tell me about the Bombay link. We'd just done the double at, uh, I think it was at, no, one's, I can't remember now. It was a long, long time ago, 10 years ago. No more, 13 years ago. And um, yeah, while I was at the bar ordering a Bombay gin and tonic, I uh, randomly thought about changing how the rear end of the bike worked with the link ratio and went back and designed a completely different link. Uh, put it on on the bike. And uh, yeah, a certain rider was using it till recently. I don't know how many years ago, but uh, a mechanic who put it in told me it was still being used about three years ago or something like that. So, And he, he didn't do bad. On the Yamaha, by any chance? Maybe. <laughs> I can say that. You don't have to. <laughs> um, what else? There, there's another one as well. I've, I've kind of got a couple of little stories <laughs> just to just to end it off with. Um, Aragon World Superbike. Uh, Scott Kennedy. PJ. <laughs> yes. Hotel Room Jenga. Hotel Room Jenga. Did, did they stack your room out? Did they put everything on top of your bed? Did, I can't remember where it was. Yeah, there was something like that. This is all from Tim Seed. I thought you were going to say... This is all from it. Tim Seed, obviously. Oh, right. I thought you were going to say about some speeding fines. What are they? Right? That was the same round, I think. Was it? <laughs> it, was the, uh, it was the European Championships final. And uh, I just landed in Barcelona and I had like an hour and a half to get to Aragon. And, um, yeah. Is that more of like a two-hour trip? The problem was, <laughs> yeah, um, was when uh, Helen... We went back to the workshop and about three weeks later, every day, there'd be an envelope going, yep, another one, another one. And I think there was about six or seven. Just to get you there in time for the champ. Just to watch the, yeah, yeah. To watch the Champions League And they final. lost anyway. Oh. No, no, it was the European Championship final. But... Oh, the Euros. The Euros, yeah. Oh, the Euros. Yeah, so a good excuse. But... So you've, hopefully you've thought of a higher car story. But let me throw one into you. Valencia <laughs> test. Stalker and Camier. And that Stalker is um, Leon Camier's friend and yeah, yeah. helper. And just for, for the ladies and gentlemen, not oh. Chris Walker. But S-T-O-R-K-A, that Stalker. Is all I know. It was a hire car with Camier and Stalker at a Valencia test. God, there were so many with them. I can't remember which one that was. <laughs> You're going to tell me. Trying to pin, no, that's all I've got. That's all Tim told me. To pinpoint that. But if you can't remember that one, tell me one from the from your memory that you that sticks out for you. I'm sure there was one with them that they had to pick Shaky's car and take it to the airport, but when they picked it up from the hotel, they picked someone else's car and drove the wrong car. That might have been the one. Is that it the one? It wasn't it? even their car. It wasn't even, no, it wasn't even car. their car, no. <laughs> I can't remember where that was. What's the one that sticks out for you? For me? Oh god. And <laughs> does it involve Colin Wright? <laughs> I'll tell you what, you could write a flipping uh, championship on hire cars. 
It's quite worrying, isn't it? It's why I ask the question um, at the end of every show. And I'm trying to think of the best one. We've had people being shot at in South Africa. Rog with um, Steve Parrish. There's, um, I'm buying your time here every night. It's Jack Valentine launching it onto the beach at Daytona. There's been so many. The, the Link Road at Cartagena, always a favourite. I think there was a famous GSE one. They weren't hire cars, they were team cars, but they okay. were, uh, I think it was a race in Italy. Uh, and having to tell Colin Wright that they were both smashed, but one went into the back of the other one. No. Uh, around about. But either that one or probably even a later round. I can't remember. What are those cars where the doors sort of come out? They slide out, don't they? Was it Renault? Where's the Volks? Well, I can't remember. A little a little bit, yeah. And um, like a little ice cream van. <laughs> yeah. We, again, a car, it was a team car, but it was driven abroad. And um, I think it was Monza, those uh, posts as you go through. And um, Daryl hit, I'm sure it was Daryl, he'll kill me if I don't think it was him. So but the I'm sure owner. the team owner, yeah. <laughs> Daryl here. Um, was in the back and had the door open. And um, as somebody was driving through these posts, they f didn't know that the door was open and it completely wiped the door open. So we had to drive it all the way back from Italy to the UK. No way. With, yeah, with the- The polythene. I can't remember what it was, plastic <laughs> sheets or something, yeah. Incredible. Took the door completely off. There's so many over the years. It, it, this is tricky. Some people go, no, I haven't got one. And you look at them and go, you have? Well, yeah, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> or they change the name of who was involved or miraculously, they weren't driving. Very often, we get a higher guy. Well, I wasn't driving is usually the first caveat of what they come back with. No, no, of course you weren't. No, no. I don't tend to drive anymore. After all those speeding fines, I decided it was better not to. Self-imposed ban. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Well, I remember... I do apologise. I'll do that outro again in a second. Um, we have our uh, patrons. We have um, guys who sign up. They get early access to the show. And they also get a chance to ask um, a couple of questions. And Okey doke. There are only a couple of questions. Uh, so start off, Mark Jackson. Mark, thank you very much. Um, who starts off with so many questions. Uh, mainly, if a crew chief's time was divided on a pie chart, what are the biggest slices? Corner entry mapping settings, suspension settings, listening to the rider. How do you? How would you divide up a pie chart in terms of uh, your time? Oh, that's a good question, isn't it? Uh, my honest answer would be each pie chart would be different for each rider. Um, so, I'm just going to throw a few names, but. Um, Last year's rider, um, there would be a big percentage on psychology, riding, um, weekend, how he does the weekend, and less suspension, everything else. Leveria, for instance, a uh, very technical rider, knew exactly what he wanted. You'd have a just purely from a suspension, 80% or, you know, it'd be a completely different thing. Um, yeah. So each one would be different. Flexible. Flexible pie charts. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty because you don't know. So it's not every year is the same because each year that pie chart changes. Uh, you might be working a lot with... Um, Electronics, you might be working a lot with suspension. Um, see, DJ was very, in fact, from 50% of the season to the end, I would say chassis almost down to about 5% because once you'd found it, you'd find it. Yep. And you'd have 80% on purely electronics. Okay. So engine brake. Um, yeah. Mainly engine okay. brake, actually. <laughs> is that the one? <laughs> that was the key. <coughs> that was the key. It is the hardest thing uh, on any rider to understand. Why? I 
I'm yet to come across one that really, really knows if you go, do you want more or less? The best way, three maps, what you've got, loads more, loads less, and they'll tell you. Which one gives them more comfort? Whether it's pushing them on into the corner, whether it's retarding it too much? Be because there's so many factors That's my level of that change the strategy, how you use the rear brake. I mean, like... But especially for en engine braking is so critical because you use it on every corner. It's every corner entry. Is that it's essentially? Yes. The, the, the problem is there's little... You've almost got to go for little secrets and hints to tell you if you've got more or less. So you could have a rider which looks like it's pushing into the corner and you need loads of engine brake. And then you'll look at the rear brake trace and go, wait a minute, why is he not using the rear brake? Well, he's not using the rear brake because it's the opposite. So there's never a right or wrong, wrong way. Um, you hope that rear brake is fixed and uh, you can sort of understand that not, not easy. This is fascinating. Absolutely. It's a shame you've got to go tomorrow. We could have another couple of hours of this. Um, from, uh, from one of our great friends, Craig Lowe, what rule changes would you bring in to MotoGP in future? <laughs> I know the first one. <laughs> Two black things. Uh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm not one for changing uh, even as fast as they are. Um, Engines or anything like that? No, nope. no. Nope. It has to. In in some ways, I'll give you a bit of time to think on that. It's the pinnacle of motorsport. The engine should be as good as they can be. It's pretty much the fastest thing in motorsport. So yeah. why lose? Why dumb it yeah, down? Exactly. Um, a lot of people say ban all electronics. Well, these things are unrideable without them. So can't do that. You can't do that. That's rider safety paramount. Um, I'm a big fan of engineering and aero. There is a limit, maybe limiting what you can do. Um, if there's anything I would change is more the whole shot devices for the starts because the bikes accelerate now at stupid speeds. I think 0 to 100 and I've seen 1.9. Um, because of all the stuff you can do, um, the bikes are lower, center of gravity is lower, so you can put more power, everything. 0 to 100 clicks. 1.9. In 1.9. Yeah, and I've seen a few. Yeah, I think I think super bikes is what, 2.6? Yeah. Like yeah. Um, the problem with that is less reaction time. Um, you know, it's a whole PlayStation now when you a procedure before you start. Um, so I would change that to for on a safety aspect for the start because there's more and more incidents in turn one. And to be fair to the riders, it's becoming harder and harder. Um, with yeah, with how fast you're going now. Yeah, I understand you're going into turn one faster than you've ever gone into before. And it's 26 riders all looking for the same piece of tarmac. Yeah. And with the changes, everyone knows you've got two, three laps to make your move. So, <laughs> <laughs> mate, this has been absolutely fascinating. Now we can end it up. Now I have remembered to do that. <laughs> Frankie, thank you so much, mate. I really appreciate your time it's fitting us in before you fly out. Best of luck for Sepang for this weekend coming with the new rider and best of luck for the 2024 season. Let's do this again, maybe at the end of the season when you get a chance to breathe because there ain't no time in between. No, appreciate it. Not with family it. and everything else. Cheers, so, buddy. Brilliant. Ladies and Thanks. gentlemen, Frankie Carcedi.